Yugoslav President Slobodan Milosevic. Milosevic reigned over what was left of Yugoslavia as it fell apart in the 1990s, surviving crippling UN sanctions, wars in Slovenia, Croatia and Bosnia, violent Albanian separatism in Kosovo, NATO airstrikes against his country, an ICTY war crimes indictment, and 40 years of marriage with a control freak wife, Milosevic was definitely a force to be reckoned with. Brutal towards his opponents at home and abroad, this banker who at one time worked in New York City as a representative of the Yugoslav bank Belbanka, where he even met American banker David Rockefeller, seemed to not really care about the economic trends that were spreading in the region. Strobe Talbot, Deputy Secretary of State under U.S. President Bill Clinton and the lead U.S. negotiator during the Kosovo War, said that as nations throughout the region sought to reform their economies, mitigate ethnic tensions and broaden civil society, Belgrade seemed to delight in continually moving in the opposite direction. It was Yugoslavia's resistance to the broader trends of political and economic reform, not the plight of the Kosovar Albanians, that best explains NATO's war. As long as Milosevic remains in control, the international community will have little influence over what happens in Belgrade. Since Milosevic didn't want to give up or share his control over the economy with anyone else, he needed to go. And he needed to go fast. Just like this guy, and 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 many others. But it was 2000, elections in Yugoslavia were just around the corner, and it was Milosevic's turn to go. This is me, protesting against Milosevic in my hometown of Subotica, Yugoslavia in 2000. I was a kid, and all I wanted was for my country to be more open, more accepted in the world community. And I wasn't alone. Since the early 1990s, there were many mass demonstrations against Milosevic, and they were led by opposition leaders such as Vuk Drašković and Zoran Džinđić. Under Milosevic, crime and corruption was around every corner, and many of his policies were extremely damaging for the people. Millions in Yugoslavia thought that if we were friendly towards the West, we'd quickly live just like they do. But to overthrow someone like Milosevic, you needed a serious team to get the job done. Hello, I'm Marovic, Ivan Marovic. In 2000, my friends and I brought down Slobodan Milosevic. You need normal people if you want to make change. So in order to do that, you need to make politics sexy, make it cool, make it hip. Revolution as a fashion line. Make repression work for you, make craziness the norm. 10,000 people in the street is news. 10 people in the street is obviously not news. But 10 people in the street doing something crazy, now that's news. This guy made a revolution happen? You've got to be kidding me. There had to have been more to it. And there was. During the Cold War, the US government loved to interfere in the domestic affairs of other countries. Among others, this was the task of the National Endowment for Democracy, or NED, which was basically a CIA spin-off. Before the elections in September of 2000 in Yugoslavia, the US government made it clear again and again that a victory by Milosevic could only have come about through fraud. In other words, irrespective of how anyone voted, Washington would only accept one result as the democratic will of the people. In 1998, Paul McCarthy testified before the Commission on Security and Cooperation in Europe. McCarthy, a program officer at the NED, boasted that among the many recipients of NED money were the newspapers Naša Borba, Vreme and Danas, an independent TV station in eastern Serbia, TV Negotin, the prominent news agency Beta, and the important Belgrade station, Radio B92. National Endowment is one of the first organizations that has helped them. They help us today. In different forms. Then it was an elementary help. They were the main elements for our work. Naturally, such media were always described in NED literature as independent. National Endowment, in many other foundations, the biggest help came from the Soros Foundation, which was at the same time bila uz nezavisne medije u Srbiji i nevladine organizacije. Ono što je za tu fondaciju bilo važno je upravo što je imala sedište u Belgradu. Dakle, njen ofis veliki je bio u Belgradu i oni su mogli da veoma lako ustanove šta se događa, koga treba pomoći, gde je najefikasnija pomoć, tako dalje. One of the organizations that were supported by the NED and many other Western interest groups was the Serbian youth organization Otpor, meaning resistance in Serbian. Ivan Marović, the tropical island-loving revolutionary, was one of the founders of Otpor, 
together with Sergei Popovich, Slobodan Homen, Nenad Konstantinovic, Slobodan Ginovic, Ivan Andrić and Dan Vanjic. Of the almost $3 million spent by the NED in Serbia since September of 1998, according to Paul McCarthy, Otvor was the largest recipient. The U.S. Agency for International Development, or USAID, said that $25 million was appropriated to Yugoslavia in 2000. The International Republican Institute, another non-governmental Washington group, according to official Daniel Kalingert, met with Otpor leaders seven to ten times in Hungary and Montenegro, beginning in October 1998. Some of the $1.8 million the institute spent in Serbia was provided directly to Otpor. By the fall of 2000, Otvor was no ramshackle students group. It was a well-oiled movement backed by several million dollars from the United States. But the Americans gave more than just money. Kalingert's organization arranged for a seminar at the luxurious Budapest Hilton from March to April 2000, where a retired U.S. Army Colonel Robert Helvey instructed more than 20 Otpor leaders in the techniques of resistance. Basically, it's techniques in provocation. Basically, it's a matter of doing things that will provoke the existing government to use force to stop whatever it is you're doing. However, Otpor was just a muscle. There needed to be an actual opposition. For that purpose, the National Democratic Institute, or NDI, which works under the NED umbrella, opened an office in Belgrade in 1997. And by 1999, the NDI had already trained over 900 party leaders and activists. Western officials met with leaders of Serbian opposition parties, urging them to unite behind one presidential candidate. The Washington Post reported that 20 opposition leaders accepted an invitation from the NDI in October of 1999 to a seminar at the Marriott Hotel in Budapest. The U.S. polling firm Penn Shun and Berlin Associates commissioned an opinion poll on the local politicians in Yugoslavia. According to the poll, Slobodan Milosevic had a 70% unfavorable rating among Serbian voters. However, the problem was that the big names in the opposition, like Zoran Djindic and Vuk Drashkovic, had negative poll ratings as well, almost as high as Milosevic's. So, a lesser-known candidate who had never cooperated with Milosevic, unlike many other opposition leaders, became Milosevic's challenger, Vojislav Kostunica, in front of the Democratic Opposition of Serbia, or DOS, which united most of the bigger opposition parties. On September 24, 2000, Elections were held in Yugoslavia and Vojislav Kostunica won more votes than Slobodan Milosevic. However, the Federal Electoral Committee declared that Kostunica didn't have more than 50% of the votes needed for an outright victory, and that a second round between Kostunica and Milosevic was to be held on October 8th. The Democratic opposition accused Milosevic of stealing the elections, and they were backed up by much of the West. Opposition politicians have produced evidence of electoral fraud in Kosovo to support claims that their candidate, Vojislav Kostunica, won an outright victory in last Sunday's presidential election. All available information points to a clear lead by the democratic opposition of Serbia's Kostunica. Today, Milosevic is a beaten, broken back president. We know he was preparing to rig the results. My message to him today, get out of the way and let Serbia get out of the prison into which you have turned it. The Serbian state-run television saw it differently. Podaci stajali su na sajtu Demokratske stranke. Tog dana Čedomir Jovanović na konferenciji za štampu DOS-a saopštio je ove podatke. U ovom trenutku odnosu dobijenim glasovima je sledeći Vojislav Koštunica 2 miliona 783 hiljade 870 glasova. Neznatno kasnije na osnovu 98,72% prebrojanih glasačkih listića, Čedimir Jovanović je saopštio ove rezultate. Gospodin Koštunica bi po našim procenama mogao da računa na 2 miliona 649 hiljada glasova. Za samo sat vremena izborni štab DOS-a izgubio je 134.852 glasa svog kandidata. Ovakva računica je dosad nezabeležena. Ona izlazi iz okvira koje poznaje matematika. Prosto rečeno, apsolutni iznos, odnosno broj glasova koje je jedan kandidat dobio, ne može se smanjivati povećanjem procenta prebrojanih glasova. 
The Democratic opposition refused to participate in the second round and called for a general strike. Tens of thousands have answered the call of the Democratic opposition of Serbia for a five-day campaign of civil disobedience. The mass protests have already begun in Belgrade and other cities. Strikes and boycotts are also planned in a concerted effort to force Milosevic to accept the opposition's general election victory. On October 5, 2000, the final mass demonstration in Belgrade included an assault on the federal parliament and radio television Serbia, led by a group of specially trained squads of former soldiers. They were followed by a mob of DOS supporters who rampaged through the building, smashing furniture and computers, and setting the parliament ablaze. But in gardening enthusiasts and plant collectors also seized the opportunity to get in on the action. After radio television Serbian Belgrade was seized, it too was torched. Milosevic was history. Democracy and freedom have come to Yugoslavia. I grew up in a small town where family came first. I don't remember much when I was very young, during the socialist Yugoslavia, but I know my family didn't have much in terms of material goods, and yet they were happy. We got most of our food locally from the farms surrounding Subotica, the education and medical care was free, our passports were welcome at every border, and many hard workers had decent jobs. My dad worked as a legal advisor at Sever, a company selling top-notch electric motors to companies in Yugoslavia and the world. This is where he met my mom. They fell in love and later married. Oh, and they had me, of course. That's when things got interesting. In the 1990s, I remember my dad traveling around the world, being a member of the executive board of the company's representative headquarters in Denmark, Germany, Italy, Hungary, Macedonia, and the United States, where Sever, among other places, exported its high-quality products. Though Sever stagnated for a while during the 80s, under the new CEO, Josip Kreininger, who was appointed in 1990, the company was expanding and becoming a world-class multinational corporation. Wow, one of those from Yugoslavia. Neat. But then in 1992, the UN imposed sanctions. Trade with the world suddenly became a big no-no. Morali smo odma preduzeti mere praktično kada su već padale rampe na granicama sa zapadom. U 5-6 dana obišli smo sve kupce u Evropi i dobavljače i dogovorili rad. Znači, naš je takav odnos bio sa inostranim kupcima da su nas toliko uvažavali da su the export of Sever's products continued via Macedonia, where a company was founded under a different name. We had a constant production, we had a market. In 1999, we entered very ambitiously. However, it came in March, the bombing. And now, thanks to the fact that Sever is in the border area, we managed to do the same thing with the foreign countries. During the bombing, we were in the middle of the bombing. I'll tell you one paradox, that we were in the same situation as we know how long it lasted. It lasted for 78 days. We were in the middle of the bombing. It lasted for 78 days. Let me allow that to sink in. Not even a wide-scale NATO bombing campaign, led by the United States, could stop a successful company like Sever. Josip Kreiniger was someone who loved his company with all his heart and was able to not only keep it alive, but to keep it growing, despite war, sanctions and bombings. But there was one thing Sever couldn't survive. 
As Mr. Kreininger watched the Parliament and state television buildings burn on television on October 5th, 2000, Mr. Kreininger, who wasn't a member of any political party, was worried about his country, but also optimistic. Svakako sam računao da je tu umešanost stranih elemenata, ali sam računao da će za privredu doći možda bolji dan, da ćemo se više otvoriti prema svetu. Sever was finally ready to become a multinational corporation. But that's not what happened. 6. October, the police, da kažem, banditske snage u sever, banditske. Prepoznavao sam da je dosta bilo toga s polja. Upali su u zgradu, naravno pobunili su ljude u jednom pogonu i upali su u zgradu gdje je moja kancelarija. Ja sam izišao i zanađen masom koja je bila. Onda smo izišli na obližnji stadion sever i oni smo je praktično lišili slobode, zarobili, proveli kao najvećeg ološa kroz čitav sebe. Gurajući ispred sebe, nisu mi dali više da se vratim u kancelariju i praktično izbacili me iz severa. Mr. Kreininger, in shock that he was replaced, ended up at the emergency room, diagnosed with heart troubles and given disability pension after six months. During the 34 years of work at Sever, this man never took a single sick day. A broken heart, one might say, was the gift the new system had in store for those who wanted to keep the domestic industry's heart beating. Odmah iza mog odlaska, Sever se zaljuljao i ja sam uvek tvrdio, stanemo li samo za dva dana, poremetit ćemo naše odnose na tržištu i kad se izgledi tržište, Severa neće biti više. Znači, već u oktobru je proizvodnja drastično pala, poremećeni odnos sa tržištom i krenuo je sunovrat. Svako o sebi dobro misli, ali ja mislim da sam bio izuzetan borac za sever i zato na vaše pitanje kako to sve doživljavam. Dakle, vrlo emotivno doživljavam. Sever had over 4,000 employees in the year 2000. After being sold to the Austrian company ATB in 2014, it had just 370 employees. Znate, kad vam je uništeno životno delo, kad su to uradili ljudi koji nisu nikad sagradili ni poljski WC, onda je to tragedija koju ja tako doživljavam. Ja mislim da je bilo neprijatno da javnost čuje jednu ispovest čoveka koji je 30 godina stvara u jednoj firmi i doveo je sa ekipama sa kojima je radio do vrhunca prisutnog na četiri kontinenta tržišta. The new guys in charge of the country had a different plan for the economy. Mi smo odmah posle 2000. godine prihvatili jedan neoliberalni program reformi koji se pokazao neuspješnim u 90. godinama u svim zemljama u tranziciji gdje je god je bio sprovođen. To je takozvani Vašingtonski konsenzus. On je razrađen od strane Međunarodnog monetarnog fonda, Svjetske banke i administracije Srednje Mrčko država. To je jedan kodifikovani program ekonomskog neokolonizma koji se zasniva na tri osnovna elementa. To je stabilizacija, liberalizacija i privatizacija. Ta finansijska stabilizacija kod nas je shvatila i svela se na skoro fiksan devizni kurs, što je vodilo precijenjenosti kursa dinara. This made Serbia unable to compete on the world market. Možemo to objasniti na jednom jednostavnom primjeru. Ako pretpostavimo da smo bili preduzeće koje je proizvodilo ove olovke i prodavali tuce olovaka za jedan dolar u Sjednje američke države, znači izvozili smo te olovke. Ukupni troškovi proizvodnje i izvoza tih odlovaka naše preduzeće je koštalo, znači u oktobru 2000. godine, 50 dina. Mi smo bili preduzeće koje dobro posluje. Proizvedemo, izvezemo, nas košta 50, dobio je jedan dolar koji zamijenimo, jer tada je kurs bio oko 60 dinara, i mi smo preduzeće koje dobro posluje. However, in the next three months, by the end of 2000, Serbia had an average increase of prices by 52%. Znači, da bi mi proizvedli isto ovo tuce olovaka koje nam trebalo u oktobru 50 dinara, nama sada treba 70 dinara. Izvezemo te olovke ponovo u Sjedinjemečkoj države, dobijemo dolar, 
Kurs dolara ostao ne promijen i dobijemo 60 dina. Mi smo bez zatvorili svoje. Thanks to stabilization, many domestic companies which could do good business had to close down. Mi smo odmah izvršili dosta široku liberalizaciju. Mi smo sve carinske stope smanjili na jednocifrene, sveli smo ih de facto na jednu trećinu, ukinuli skoro sva bezcarinska ograničenja i omogućili da inostrana roba bude konkurentija na našem tržištu, odnosno da naša roba bude nekonkurentna. That's how many of the other domestic companies were destroyed, as they couldn't compete with subsidized foreign goods, many at dumping prices, so they too had to be closed down. With many companies closed down and destroyed, they were now being sold off by the state. I ta prodaja preduzeća koja je vršena, sredstva od prodaje išla su uglavnom u budžet državi i umjesto se koriste eventualno za razvoj, koristili se za tekuću potrošnju. Isproveli smo jednu zaista lošu pljačkašku privatizaciju. Svi građani Srbije to znaju. Mnogo ljudi je ostalo bez posla, stotine hiljada ljudi i znaju šta se sa tim preduzećima dešavalo. Uglavnom, novi vlasnici, menadžeri su kupili preduzeći radi biznisa iz koga su preko svojih offshore kompanija izlačili novac. Tako da njima interes bile te kompanije, a ne osnovno društvo. Hold on, who were the genius masterminds behind all this? I had a chance to chat with Dinkić in 2012 after a press conference in my hometown of Subotica. Za ekonomsku politiku, stabilizaciju, liberalizaciju i privatizaciju, trudi se da će doneti ekonomski prosperitet građanima, a Srbija je ekonomski urušena. Što se tiče vašeg stvarskog konsenzusa, cela ga Evropa svodila dok je on bio aktualan. On je bio aktualan 90. godina, početkom 2000-ih. Stvari su u životu, a i u ekonomiji promenljive. Dakle, ne možete istu ekonomsku filozofiju da gurate celog života jer ono ste budala. But Dinkić didn't give up on the Washington consensus until it was too late. Under the rule of the post-Milosevic prime minister Zoran Džinđić, attracting foreign investors was priority number one. So, many of the first firms offered on sale were intentionally assigned a book value of one-third of their true value. Sharply reduced tax rates were offered as further inducement for foreign investors. Yugoslavia was finally open for business. Nije bitna cena po kojoj se nešto prodaje. Evo sad smo uzeli nazad za jedan. To nije bitna cena. Nije bitna cena. Bitno je da li možete zaposti ljude i da pravite profit. And employment was something Dinkić and his colleagues cared a lot about. Companies that were privatized first showed a decrease of 45% in employment over the first two years of private ownership. Instead of caring for the workers, the government actually decided to speed up the layoffs and came up with a new law requiring staff to be sacked prior to sale in order to attract investors. <laughs> Unemployment in Serbia steadily grew, quickly reaching 32% within four years. By 2012, it stood at 24%. Sounds better? Nope, just an illusion because Serbia adopted the modern American model for calculating unemployment, labeling those who weren't actively seeking jobs as merely out of the job market and technically not unemployed, even though they still had no jobs. If you included those, the real unemployment rate was at 34%. To put this in perspective, at its peak in 1933, unemployment during the Great Depression in the United States reached 25%, and that percentage was calculated in the old way, that didn't exclude a significant portion of workers. I gdje smo mi sada stigli poslije deset godina? Recimo, industrijska proizvodnja, 2010, ona je za 11,4% manja nego 98. godine. Poslijem, 98. godine to je godina bila kad smo imali sankcije pred bombardu. Da ne spomnimo 90. godinu. Naša industrijska proizvodnja je više nego prepolovljena. Ona sada iznosi 46,7% proizvodnje iz 1990. The West isolating and attacking Yugoslavia from 1992 to 2000 did great harm to the economy. But it seems that the West supposedly helping Yugoslavia as of 2000 made many things even worse. Why? From a historical standpoint, this made more sense. Is it Greece? No. 
Is it the French Riviera? No. Is it Turkey? Austria? Switzerland? Rome? No. It's all Yugoslavia. A fascinating blend of all that attracts the traveler to Europe. The country itself can best be described as the best of Europe. <laughs> Yugoslavia was an important player in the, in the world, especially after World War II when the United States uh, took on the Soviet Union and made it its chief enemy. When uh, Tito split from Stalin and formed a third way, not only Tito, this includes uh, Nehru in India, it includes Tito, it includes Sukarno in Indonesia, and Gabdel Abdul Nasser in Egypt, and Nkrumah in Ghana. These are hugely rich countries with huge resources. The socialist Yugoslavia was, uh, you know, in a way, a Casablanca of the Cold War. We were, you know, neither in the West nor in the East, and uh, we had relations with both. And, and Yugoslavia, as a leader of the non-aligned movement, had a role to play in this uh, divided world. There was a desire for neutrality to avoid the arms build up, to waste money, to use the resources of these countries to help people in their countries. However, shortly after the split with the Soviets in 1948, Yugoslavia, still shattered after World War II, needed to consolidate its economy and began to receive loans from the United States and the World Bank. Prvi kredit koji smo dobili u temelju te nastajanja jugoslavenske privrede dobili smo 1949. godine u visini od 3 milijuna dolara. Uvjet za dobivanje tog zajma prema Sjedinjim američkim državama i Svjetskoj banci bili su da Jugoslavija vrati grčke partizane iz Južne Srbije i Makedonije u Grčku. Po povratku istih u Grčku zapravo su Grci sve poklali. The lives of those partisans were the price for the consolidation of Yugoslavia's economy. It didn't matter that Yugoslavia declared itself neutral. John Foster Dulles, who was Eisenhower's Secretary of State, very clearly said that neutrality was immoral. It's just a strange concept, but that was his attitude, that communism had to be rolled back, so the U.S. was taking a very aggressive position. Three of these five people that I mentioned were removed with the participation of the United States from power. Only two made it. Tito, who was a giant, because he fought as a partisan, he had a strong army and he had a strong base, and he was able to say no to Stalin. At the same time, the U.S. could not get in with him. But the U.S. was able to slowly creep in with their loans. Krediti su bili od 3 milijuna do 15, 20, do 30 milijuna na 5 godina, 10 godina. Znači, mi smo ipak imali srednjoročne, a ne dugoročne kredite. Mi smo, uzimajući te kredite, u pozadini imali da nam je Zapad, posebno Sjedine američke države, dalo specijalni tretman Jugoslaviji. Kad sam ja otkrio što je zapravo taj specijalni tretman, piše doslovno u izvornim dokumentima iza tih kredita. Maksimalo ih pomagat do uništenja. Hmm, that's the kind of help the U.S. had in mind? Thank you? The IMF was making loans into this region and, in a sense, not helping the situation financially. The U.S. had no interest in helping this situation heal itself. But that, after all, is what neoliberalism was all about. The ideological foundation of what we call neoliberalism today was given by Ludwig von Mises and Friedrich von Hayek, two Austrian economists. Mises believed that egoism was the prime law of society, while Hayek claimed that a free market creates a spontaneous order that fixes the issues of economic calculation. In essence, neoliberals demand that you deregulate the market, privatize almost everything, cut government services, and by doing so, they believe the economy will pretty much fix itself. In 1947, an organization called the Mont Pelerin Society was formed to bring together neoliberal intellectuals around the world. The goal of the Mont Pelerin Society was not to convince the masses that neoliberalism was the way to go, as they considered the people to be mere followers of the elite. They shifted their attention to winning sympathies of intellectuals worldwide. A prominent member of the Mont Pelerin Society, called Milton Friedman, decided to get the ball rolling. 
As the leader of the Chicago School of Economics, Friedman started collaborating with the Catholic University of Chile, from which students were sent to the University of Chicago and were indoctrinated with neoliberalism. They returned to Chile and were ready to shape Chile's economy after the democratically elected government of President Salvador Allende was overthrown in a CIA-backed coup led by Augusto Pinochet on September 11, 1973. Chile was a case in which a military regime headed by Pinochet was willing to switch the organization of the economy and in that process a group of people who had been trained at the University of Chicago in the Department of Economics who came to be called the Chicago Boys played a major role in designing and implementing the economic reforms. Milton Friedman was also personally involved in the Chile experiment. I did make a trip to Chile and I made talks in Chile. In fact, I did meet with Mr. Pinochet. As they listened to Friedman's advice, the economy slowly started collapsing, even though the elites, together with Friedman, were convincing the people that they were building a better society. If you want to live in a society where, where your compatriots are poor and you are rich, and you think that's better, a better society, then you would like it. A Chilean family trying to live on the average wage had to spend 75% of its income on bread. Riding the bus or drinking milk became luxuries. Those who revolted were put in concentration camps. 100,000 people were jailed, thousands were killed. I am more than willing to share in the credit for the extraordinary task job that our students did down there. In neighboring Argentina, President Isabel Perón was overthrown in a military coup. And as Friedman's disciples filled key economic positions in the country, within a year of the coup, wages dropped by 40%. Factories closed, poverty spread, dissidents simply disappeared. The neoliberal coups didn't stop there. Que é o golpe contra Allende, né? No Brasil contra João Goulart, não? E em toda a região da América Latina e América Central, né? Que é a busca de anexar política e economicamente esta região. After Latin America, the economic policies of Milton Friedman spread to Western countries themselves. In Britain, Margaret Thatcher defeated the biggest union in the country, the mining union and pushed through the neoliberal reforms selling off the steel industry, water, electricity, gas, telephones, airlines, oil, and cutting many social programs. America with President Ronald Reagan did much of the same, widening the gap between the rich and the poor. The big prize, of course, was the Soviet Union. Having won the Cold War, and that led, of course, to the breakup of the Soviet uh, Empire, both uh, in the Warsaw Pact and Eastern European countries uh, and uh, within the Soviet Union itself. Uh, that has uh, helped contribute to a uh, movement toward uh, democracy. In fact, democracy was to be quickly trumped by Western financial interests. While Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev propagated a gradual transition to Scandinavian-style socialism with help from the West, he didn't understand what kind of help the West was ready to give. The U.S. could have prevented the meltdown of the Soviet economy with an infusion of aid after Gorbachev withdrew the troops from uh, Eastern Europe, but did not do so. Few people knew what a radical transformation of the economy meant for the newly established Russian Federation. As a matter of fact, many Russian intellectuals were behind President Boris Yeltsin, whose advisors were also Friedman's disciples. The Moscow intellectuals, you couldn't tell them what it was like. They were saying, oh, the poorest people in your country live better than I do. Here's a guy sitting there, he had a small apartment, okay, a wall of books, educated at Moscow University, speaks fluent English, never went hungry one day in his life. And we would say, well, we have people who live in doorways. They sleep in doorways. They eat out of garbage cans. I've seen them myself. And they say, oh, you don't have to lie to us. Oh, they don't. They would not believe it. America, America. Yeah, you want America? You'll get America. A small number of businessmen in Russia became billionaires, better known as oligarchs, while a third of all Russians dropped below the poverty line. State industries were sold off at bargain prices. Boris Yeltsin, with full support of America, dissolved parliament as only a dictator could ensure the implementation of Friedman's economic policies. I think you get the picture here. Neoliberalism was imposed in dictatorships and in states of emergency, while the population was in shock something author Naomi Klein coined as the shock doctrine. 
The pioneer of shock therapy was an economist named Jeffrey Sachs, who traveled and administered his economic therapy to patient countries designated by the West. In 1991, Božidar Jelic, who would later become Serbia's Minister of Economy and Finances after Milosevic was deposed, met Jeffrey Sachs, who recruited him for three years of service in Poland and Russia as a top-level advisor to those countries' neoliberal reforms. In an interview for Harvard Business School, Jelic described the reforms as being honest with the patient and administering the dose of medicine required for recovery. Because when a patient needs to recover, shock is definitely the best medicine, eh? When I look at all the chaos that happened in all those countries, from the coups in Latin America, the Falklands War that allowed Thatcher to push through her policies, to the burning White House in Moscow after Yeltsin ordered its shelling, I can't help but wonder whether the burning Yugoslav parliament building and TV station was meant to have the same effect. Maybe instead of looking at the smoke, we should have been looking what had already happened next door. 1994. Hrvatska je bila u ratnom stanju i radi ratnog stanja je država imala veći proračunski deficit, a istodobno je izostao takozvani devizni priljev od turizma i došlo je do deficita platne bilance. Znači više je deviza izlazilo iz zemlje nego ulazilo. This led to a hyperinflation in Croatia. Hrvatska rješava problem hiperinflacije na način da pretvara središnju banku u mjenjačnicu. I tu zapravo počinje cijeli problem. Naime, do 1994. država je radila emisiju novca, takozvanog hrvatskog dinara. Nakon 1994. za svaku kunu koja se pušta u opticaj, bilo je potrebno vani se zadužiti. To znači da je kuna pretvorena u bon za euro. Odnosno, da ako recimo domaća banka želi vama kao fizičkoj osobi dati kredit, ona ne može posuditi od središnje banke kune koje bi potom posudila vama, već mora prvo vani na stranom tržištu novca posuditi eure, onda te eure u HNB-u pretvara u kune i zato sve kune koje ljudi dobivaju u obliku kredita dolaze sa valutnom klauzulom. This monetary policy known as the quasi fixed exchange rate wasn't new. It was first adopted by Thailand in the 1980s. The way it works is you tie your country's official exchange rate to another country's currency. In this case, Croatia tied it to the euro. This creates the illusion of a fluctuating exchange rate, the illusion of a Croatian currency. Čak se i naš novac uopće niti ne proizvodi u Hrvatskoj. To je jedna stravična spoznaja. Znači, ako uzmete novčanicu od 10 kuna, tu gdje je Pulska arena, na donjoj strani piše Gieske end de Vrijend, Germany. Na novčanicu od 20 kuna piše Gieske end de Vrijend, Germany. Znači tiskara je Njemačka. Na novčanici od 50 kuna pak one se proizvode u Austriji. Piše evo CEPS Austrija. Novčanica od 1000 kuna također se proizvodi u Njemačkoj. I na kraju 100 kuna CEPS Austrija. Makes you wonder who runs the show when it comes to the Croatian economy. Na postavljeno pitanje takozvane Hrvatskoj narodnoj banci radi čega se kune ne tiskaju u Hrvatskoj odgovor je bio da se kod nas novac ne isplati ekonomski proizvodit. I onda se postavlja ono suštinsko pitanje. Ukoliko se u našoj državi ne isplati proizvoditi novac, što se onda isplati proizvoditi? Was this the Croatia that its first president, Franjo Tuđman, had promised to the people when it declared independence from Yugoslavia in 1991, triggering a bloody war that lasted four years? A high-ranking official in Tuđman's party, the Croatian Democratic Union, or HDZ, in the 1990s, Domagoj Margetic saw Tuđman's project in a different light from how the Croatian media presented him. To je čovjek koji je od početka imao fix ideju stvaranja jedne bogate hrvatske elite, vijesto bogatih obitelji u Hrvatskoj. Pritom, dakle, Tuđman je vodio brigu samo o bogaćenju svoje obitelji i njemu bliskih obitelji. S druge strane, Tuđman je nesporno bio gospodar rata, gospodar krvi, sav taj profit koji je stekla i njegova obitelj i tih 200 obitelji, zapravo je krvavi novac, stečen na pljački u sred rata. Do 90-te nisu imali za kavu, a nakon 92. su bili multimiljoneri. This was the case in other countries as well during the Yugoslav wars, and money seemed to be a higher interest than winning territories through war, which even brought some leaders on opposite sides of the conflict together. Kako objasniti situaciju da su cijelo vrijeme rata Milošević i Tuđman imali najmanje tri zajedničke banke u inozemstvu, 
u njih ulagali kapital, u njima držali tajne račune. Evo vam jedan primjer, dakle, Bank Franko Jugoslav u Parizu. Pola pola su vlasnici Hrvati i Srbi cijelo vrijeme rata. Ja sam našao odluke Tuđmanovog režima, pisane odluke 1993. godine o dokapitalizaciji Bank Franko Jugoslav u Parizu. U istom tjednu, kada znate ko je predsjednik uprave te banke, nominalno, sada pokojni Bora Milošević. Bora Milošević was Slobodan Milošević's brother. Onda će me neko uvjeravati da to nije bio dogovoreni rat. You can imagine how soldiers shooting at each other on the battlefield would feel if they knew their leaders and their families were working together on getting extremely rich. The project of dismantling a socialist country to create a rich minority and a poor majority is what neoliberalism was all about. This is why all of it was wholeheartedly supported by the West. I tu su, znate, elite na, u Jugoslaviji i elite e, na Zapadu našli zajednički interes. Zapadu je očito bio interes raspad Jugoslavije, a ove elite ovdje su trebale e, prikriti svoju pljačku. To su mogle jedino ratom. Jedino ratom se Jugoslavija očito mogla raspasti. I zato je Zapad apsolutno blagoslivljao takvo stanje. Publicly, the West was condemning war profiteering and crimes against humanity. The International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, better known as the Hague Tribunal, was put in charge of punishing those who committed crimes. The chief prosecutor of the tribunal was Carla Del Ponte. I was all my life prosecutor in Switzerland. And uh, uh, once uh, Switzerland wanted to present me as candidate for the International Tribunal for former Yugoslavia, I said yes because it was uh, a new experience, a new challenge. A challenge that proved to be quite difficult at times, especially when it came to investigating perhaps the most gruesome case of crimes against humanity and war profiteering there is, organ trafficking, which took place in Kosovo during the war. In 1999, Kosovo Albanians put over 300 hostages in trucks and transported them across the border to northern Albania. Before killing Serbs and members of other ethnic communities, Kosovo Albanians removed their vital organs and sold them for transplant. The butchering reportedly took place in the Katuchi family house, which was dubbed the Yellow House near the town of Burel in Albania. I received a report about uh, this issue and uh, I must say, at the very beginning I did not believe it. I said it's not possible. But uh, the evidence we got uh, confirms that it was reality, so it was my duty as prosecutor to continue this investigation. Unfortunately, it was not possible to continue. Why not? Uh, because we have no, no cooperation. Albania was refusing us to uh, to investigate in the country because uh, we have some indications that it was a mass grave there. Nunmik was not full cooperating with us, so we, we were uh, obliged to, to suspend the investigation. The head of Unmik was Bernard Kushner, and no one could explain why this investigation was being obstructed. When asked by a reporter if he himself was involved in the organ smuggling, Kushner took it very seriously. <laughs> La vente des organes. Mais vous êtes malade, non J'ai une tête à vendre des organes, moi. Mais vous êtes fou, vous croyez n'importe quelle connerie Ne croyez pas ces bêtises. Quelle maison jaune Pourquoi jaune Ça, je te jure. En Albanie. Est-ce que ça a existé Monsieur, vous devriez aller consulter. Les, ceux, les gens qui disent ça sont des salauds et des assassins. One of those idiots and murderers, as Kushner would describe them, would have to be, I guess, Swiss prosecutor to the Council of Europe, Dick Marty as well, as he too talked about the Yellow House. In his 2010 report, Dick Marty uncovered that Hashim Tachi, who was the Prime Minister of the self-proclaimed Republic of Kosovo at the time the report came out, was the head of a mafia-like group responsible for smuggling weapons, drugs, and human organs through Europe. As stated in the report, the so-called Kosovo Liberation Army, or KLA, held prisoners in a network of six facilities located in Albania, and Tachi's Drenica group had the greatest responsibility for the prisons and the fate of those held there. The healthiest prisoners were transferred to a farmhouse near Fushakruya, where they were killed for their organs. Why didn't the West react? Because uh, Kaili was supporting NATO during the conflict, they had some difficulty to cooperate with us against, against the people who helped them. You know, it is politically, if you are my associate in a conflict, how can you uh, 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 act against 
uh, no, against my associates. In a few cases, however, the Hague Tribunal did manage to bring an indictment against Kosovo Albanians who were accused of committing crimes, like in the case of Ramos Haradinaj. Don't let the glasses fool you. Haradine was one ruthless KLA militant in the 1990s, accused of murdering Serbs, Roma, and even non-compliant Albanians during the Kosovo War. We had a lot of difficulties to come to an end to the investigation against Haradine. But at the end, we achieved it. So we could issue an indictment against him. And this indictment was confirmed by a judge. However, as the trial started and progressed, something strange happened. Haradina was freed of all charges because a number of witnesses were killed. According to former Hague Tribunal Prosecutor Kaladin Ponte, nine witnesses were killed between 2003 and 2007. So in such a situation, living witnesses are frightened and some of them refuse to testify or change their testimony. The UN mission in Kosovo always refused to cooperate with the Hague Tribunal by refusing to send evidence of war crime. It is understandable that NATO didn't want their KLA buddies in jail, but the largest single act of ethnic cleansing during the Yugoslav wars, Operation Storm, in which Croat forces ethnically cleansed a quarter of a million Serbs from the Krajina region in Croatia, with thousands killed in cold blood, was perhaps the biggest test for the tribunal. General Ante Gotovina was in charge of that operation, and the Hague Tribunal put up an indictment. Gotovina was arrested and tried, and believe it or not, Convicted. First instance trial, he was convicted 23 years. So, evidences were there. Enough evidences to convict and to sentence him. However, another strange thing happened here. The case quickly went to appeal, the previous sentence was overturned, and Gotovina was immediately released. It was extremely damaging to Serbs in this case, you know, and uh, killing in Operation Storm. They oblige the Serbs to, to leave clean and so on and so on. So we, we prove it. In the first instance, the Gotovina was, was convicted. So why now on appeal this completely different, different decision? You think it was more of a political decision? You say it and uh, I must say yes, because I cannot believe it. Ante Gotovina was given a hero's welcome in Croatia. But not all Croats believed in the Gotovina myth. Gotovina in the last four years has worked on the hydroelectric construction in the moment of privatization of about 200 million kuna, a house in the residential part of Zagreb, which today is worth a million euros, he worked only on the construction of auto cars, 20 million kuna, he worked on a villa in the Pakoštan, which today is worth about 3,5 million euros in the same sea, and another general pension, which is worth 1,500 euros. That's for him. Kavo i piće s prijateljima. I to je heroj. Po svakoj definiciji, to je ratni profiter. This war profiteer, however, was a free man with the blessing of the West. He played an important part in what the West really wanted. And when a nation has war profiteers as heroes, it's no wonder that as the fighting subsides, the system remains corrupt. Tuđman je 90-ih godina imenovao takozvane tajne povjerenike koji su formalno pravno bili vlasnici tajnih računa u inozemstvu. Tu je bilo i kriminalaca i političara. Tu su zajedno povjerenici bili Vladimir Zagorec, osuđen zbog organiziranog kriminala, najodlikovaniji hrvatski general. Hrvoje Petrač, osuđen zbog organiziranog kriminala, notorni šef jedne od mafija u Hrvatskoj. Tu vam je Branimir Glavaš, osuđeni ratni zločinac. Tu vam je Ivan Čermak, naftni bos koji je svoj naftni kapital stekao na ratnom profiterstvu i trgovini naftom Sarkanom u vrijeme rata. Tu vam je Ivo Sanader. Ivo Sanader ruled as Prime Minister of Croatia from 2003 to 2009, and under the mask of being a European Union friendly statesman, bought people left and right. Sanader je mislio da je on novi tuđman. Okupio je ekipu i rekao sada ćete sve tajne račune na kojima ste povjerenici kontrolu predati meni. Naravno, ni za kog od njih, Ivo Sanader nije imao autoritet Franje tuđman. Since this didn't work, Sanader had to look elsewhere for money. Krenuo je pljačkat javna poduzeća, izvlačit novac iz hrvatske elektroprivrede, iz hrvatskih autocesta, nastavio šverc cigareta. Dakle, morao je naći alternativne izvore tih multimilijunskih crnih prihoda. According to the Washington Times, Sanader turned Croatia into a gangster country. And by controlling most of the media, including state television, and leading Croatian newspapers, 
he could make sure that the people only saw things his way. During his rule, Sanader amassed enormous wealth that included illegally acquired property, luxurious villas, and a lavish collection of watches worth over $200,000. After six years in power, Sanader decided to step down. Good, finally a stop to the criminalization of the state. Eventually, Sanader was arrested, put on trial and sentenced to 10 years for his wrongdoings. However, the system remained corrupt, and the people of the former Yugoslavia could only hope that an honest, hard-working man would show up and fight against systemic corruption. He came in the form of a TV morning talk show guest. Whoops, no, not this guy. I meant the other guy. Ljubiša Milanović was appointed by former Serbian Health Minister Zoran Stanković to his anti-corruption division. He was the first state official to openly criticize the police, state prosecutors, and anti-corruption agency, claiming that they just weren't interested in helping him fight corruption. Ja sam pre jedno dva i po meseca otišao u gradski sup sa jednim predmetom kompletiranim, znači ne sa, samo što nije napisana krivišna prijava, znači sa svim dokazima. Otišao sam kod nadležnog načelnika, doneo predmet, dragi gospodin je svo vreme gledao crtani film, možda ste vi puštali neki dobar crtani film u to vreme. I onda, kad pa ja patak tamo nije radio to što treba da radi, onda bi je uz put me pitao o čemu se radi, ali mu je prioritet bio crtani film. Yes, the cartoon never ended, but Milanovic's position did. He quickly got sacked by Health Minister Stanković after these statements on state television. Fortunately, the Serbian political elite took these warnings seriously and decided to act decisively. Ah, but who can blame them? That's what the people love to watch. They've been conditioned by the media to look the other way when it came to matters of urgency that could really affect their lives. Considering what the new guys after Milosevic did to the education system, it made some sense. Former Yugoslavia had an excellent educational system. I'm product of that system, so most of the people from those years, my colleagues, are all over the world and they're extremely successful. However, what happened after 2001, they simply assumed that whatever was suggested by European Union, they have to implement it regardless of consequences. In 2001, Yasmina Vujic, a professor at Berkeley University, the first woman to become dean of the Department of Nuclear Engineering in the United States, suggested to the then Minister of Education Gasha Knežević and his associate professor Srbijan Katurajlić that before they attempt any reforms, they should invite professors from the diaspora who worked in all kinds of education systems and form the best one for Serbia. There was no reply. The reforms went on as planned. Gašak Knežević je želeo da se celokupan koncept tradicionog obrazovanja zameni jednim novim neoliberalnim obrazovanjem. Nakon 15 godina vidimo da je dovelo do katastrofalnih posljedica. Po nekim istraživanjima trećina džaka je funkcionalno nepismeno. Čak 20% džaka koji su završili srednje škole govore da nisu pročitali niti jednu knjigu. Tako da je celokupan sistem obrazovanja došao na najniže grane u istoriji obrazovanja u Srbiji. Bottom line is that students of today are learning 10% of what we learn in the previous system. So they are producing new generations of students that will be poorly educated, particularly in terms of higher education in my field, such as electrical engineering or mechanical engineering and so on. Yes, the education system made no sense, and no one had the guts to fix it. 
After all, a good education system would lead to a smart populace. And which government in their right mind would want a free-thinking society that could critically analyze what that same government was doing? Things weren't any better for cultural workers or artists. Culture and art simply weren't on the radar for many people. The most interesting story I heard was when independent filmmaker Branko Radakovic, who was making his documentary Culture is Blooming, asked a guy in the Serbian town of Paracin about his thoughts on culture. Branko put his answer in the film trailer. Then he got a call from the guy. Uh-oh, somebody was too honest in front of the camera. The guy still wanted the clip removed. Branko refused. Since the government didn't waste time on irrelevant tasks such as creating a civilized populace, the media used their power to popularize shows that educated and enlightened the people on what really mattered. It seems that the role of the media was simply to create and foster a nation of, well, idiots. Where the law and democracy could cause a problem, they were scrapped. You use the term democracy, its presence or its absence, strictly for politics. The United States has a pretty good record, I think, over the centuries of helping uh, move uh, countries uh, toward uh, democracy. In fact, the United States instituted regime change wherever democracy resulted in a leader who was not favorable to Western economic interests. Any country or political movement that tries to use the land, the labor, the capital, the markets of that country in a way outside of this global imperial system will be designated as an enemy, as an aggressor, as an oppressor, as a, a danger to the American people, and, that, and therefore we have to attack them. It was also important to make the American people afraid of the proclaimed enemy. I was raised my whole generation, it was the communists. Communists here, communists everywhere. Communists going to get your mama, you know? You are the target of those who would trample the liberties of free men. You are in the crosshairs of the bomb site. An enemy is centering on you. Now the communists are gone, and that became a crisis for a while. They had to find another demon who is a threat and frightens the people enough. And now it's a terrorist, the terrorist. Since the end of the uh, Cold War, 1991, and the end of communism, the United States has behaved very badly. It's a sole superpower. It has tried to dominate the world completely. Your country has to be thrown open. It has to be a satellite for us. The empire sees two kinds of nations out there. One is satellites, or client states they're called, and the other is potential enemy. Iraq is a very special, interesting case because you saw both of those things happening with the very same 
leader, Saddam Hussein, when he was murdering everybody on the left, when he destroyed the Iraqi democracy, Washington loved him. They loved him. They sent him aid. They took pictures with him, and he was their poster boy. And then when he turned around and started insisting on a better deal on the oil quotas, he didn't go toward the free market, and he committed economic nationalism. Then they suddenly started saying, oh, Saddam Hussein, he's, he's worse than Hitler. It seemed very dangerous to support policies the U.S. didn't like, and it didn't matter whether you were a dictator or a Democrat. When Hugo Chavez was democratically elected in Venezuela in 1998, promising to stand up to the United States, many thought he wouldn't last long. His first task was to change the 1961 constitution that was drawn up by the neoliberal elites. This constitution was making for them for their benefit, not for the benefit of the people. Who promised the people in 1998 in the campaign to do that, and in 1999 who make a new constitution. In our constitution, in the first article, we change our foreign policy. Our policy will be based in uh, three important things, cooperation, complementation, and solidarity. What this meant in practice was soon noticeable. In 2001, when in Argentina was a very difficult economy situation, no, the first country and the only country helped Argentina was Venezuela, was Chavez. Cristina all the time said that. Chavez tell her, you have no dollars, uh, you have coal, you have meat, uh, and we have oil. We give you oil. You can pay oil with coal, with meat. It is not necessary to use dollar. <laughs> Wait, working together on exchanging products they produce? Not bickering amongst each other? Not importing US products? Not using the dollar? Blasphemy. He announced that Venezuela would pull out of both the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund and his government took control of the last remaining privately run oil fields. Chavez only practiced a state socialism that used to be practiced in, in Yugoslavia. But for this, Chavez became an enemy of the United States. Hugo Chavez is, uh, is uh, a dictator. The world's worst dictators. Hugo Chavez. The dictator. A dictator. Anti-democratic despot. Tyrant with a radical agenda. Crushing free people. There is such a thing as a killer clown and he may be it. In, in 15 years, we have 19 elections. 19. And we only didn't win in one. We won. 18 election, 18. And all the time say that Chavez is a dictator. And now they are saying that Maduro is a dictator. Uh, Fox News President. Fox, Fox, Fox News. Fox News. Fox News. Fox News. Stupid people from Fox News. Stupid or not, the media were playing an important role for what was being prepared for Chavez. It was 2002, and for the CIA, everything was going as planned. In the end, this is what triggered the overthrow of Hugo Chavez. Armed gangs loyal to the Venezuelan president firing on thousands of anti-government protesters. After 16 people were killed and hundreds wounded, last night soldiers surrounded the presidential palace. Even though it was never established who fired at both pro-Chavez and anti-Chavez demonstrators, Chavez was taken to prison. Another democratically elected leader was replaced by a dictator, Venezuelan Federation of Chambers of Commerce President Pedro Carmona, a pro-business elites leader who quickly dissolved the National Assembly and Supreme Court and declared the constitution void. While the United States were cheering on the real dictator, Carmona, something unexpected happened. People started pouring into the streets. A pro-Chavez popular uprising was becoming unstoppable. The power of the people in the street. We go to the street and in front of us was the military. Uh, we are not uh, afraid. We go on no? and we ask that we want our president, we want our president back. 
The pro-Chavez presidential guards took back the presidential palace and reinstalled Chavez as president. The coup d'etat failed. In spite of huge CIA support and almost all of the Venezuelan media also supporting the coup. When Chavez came to power, 80% of the country was classified as poor. Now our poor people is less than 20%. At the beginning of Chavez's rule, 45% were extremely poor. So now very, very poor is 5.6%. It's the first time in the history of Venezuela that 65% of the money we get about the oil are using for increase the level of living of uh, the people. Perhaps Chavez had some good ideas, and his ideas spread throughout Latin America. Inicia com o presidente, com a eleição do presidente Hugo Chávez e logo depois a América Latina ela passa a ter um novo rosto político. Joga um, é criado, é formado um novo mapa geopolítico da nossa região. Isso também gerou uma união muito grande e o povo resolveu dar um fim a esses governos neoliberais e sair do jugo do consenso de Washington. A continent away. A country was feeling the shackles of debt, and many people simply didn't understand why it paralyzed the country. The so-called sovereign foreign debt of Greece was created and accumulated by the policies of the governments, which were doing neoliberal policies, by the way, taking loans from the international markets, giving cheap loans to entrepreneurs and to enterprises, which were then taking the money out to Switzerland or to the Cayman Islands and so on, without investing them, without creating growth, without creating giving jobs within the capitalist system. What a fine system it was. The debt uh, have not been created by the peoples, neither in the case of Greece, nor in the case of Portugal or Ireland. But the people were the ones who were supposed to pay the price. This is why the people of many countries facing this problem went to the streets to demand justice. Many of these countries had already repaid their debts several times over, but because of the interest rates, they were condemned to a never-ending vicious cycle of debt payments. However, one president decided that when it came to his country paying off these debts, enough was enough. Ecuador refused paying the debt after Rafael Correa came to power, who was second and third time re-elected, and he said, no, we have paid it already. President Correa's the man. He declared his country's debt illegitimate and said that Ecuador would default on over $3 billion worth of bonds. He pledged to fight the creditors in international courts and actually succeeded, reducing the price of outstanding bonds by over 60%. If the loans are uh, given, this means to make profit, to make business uh, actually through the, the poor countries which are in debt, then uh, there is also legally by international law a basis to claim that you cannot pay back after 10 years paying, paying, paying. You have paid it already two times. For that, you need the willing governments which will confront the powerful banks and the IMF and so on. President Correa reduced Ecuador's poverty, indigence and unemployment. And he could do this because he had the people behind him. But another reason why some countries were successful in rebelling against Western control is also because they had a strong military. Yugoslavia had the fourth largest military in Europe, and while it was united, no one dared to attack it militarily at the time. A source from Serbia's military security agency that asked to remain anonymous told me just how ready Serbia was to defend itself against an external enemy. Vojska ovakva kakva jeste teško da može da doprinese zaštiti teritorijalitet, bar ne neko razumno vreme. A i pitanje je šta razumno vreme, šta posle tog vremena, jer vi jednostavno nemate kapacitet su prosti. Znate, Srbija 220 tenko. Šta ćete vi sa 220 tenkova da uradi? This comes as no surprise. Boris Tadic, who was among the first to hold the post of Minister of Defense of Serbian Montenegro after Milosevic fell, later becoming President of Serbia in two terms, prided himself on his achievements in regards to the military. Though they were called experts by the government, pushing Serbia's military towards so-called NATO standards was top priority. When someone starts shooting at you, your English proficiency and computer skills might not be enough to protect yourself. We were just so 
redukovali broj vojnika Srbije, redukovali broj teškog naoružanja. Zapravo mislim da je to neka vrsta čiste posledice razmišljanja da vojska treba da služi pre svega za mirovne misije, takozvane mirovne misije, mada ja mislim da su to borbene misije, da li u okviru Ujedinjih nacija, da li u okviru Evropske unije ili nešto pridruženo NATO, ali za neki ozbiljni boj, tu ja ne vidim potencijale. Military analyst Miroslav Lazanski explained on Serbian national television why the military was unable to adequately protect the country from wide-scale flooding that took place in 2014. Kompletno je vojska transformisana onako kako su to tražili iz inostranstva. Imamo generalštva, odnosno ministarstvo po onim G-ovima, po NATO, standard G1, G2, G3, pa sad neki izvole ti G-ovi pa neki idu pune vreće s peskom i neka spašavaju narod. Pa ne moguće da je glavna ves na televiziji da su dve amfibije stigle u šabac. Pa gde su te silne amfibije koje je vojska imala? Kako se može doći u situaciju da se preko televizije uputi javni apel da ne dostaje 150 lopata? Ljudi, donesite lopate u šabacu. Pa gde su ta skladi? Takvi apeli postoje svuda u svetu. Ajmo da se okrenemo. Nema, u uređenim državama, barem ima lopate. Pošto nije ulagano sistematske u vojsku zadnjih 20 godina, reforme vojske koje su glamorozno slavljene kao vrhunske, nama su vojni savjetnici bili britanski i holandski generali i ovako su nam postrojili vojsku. Ovo je samo rezultat toga. As the people were becoming aware that western imposed reforms weren't in the interest of ordinary citizens, the West had to make sure that the people, their leaders, and the media would stay in line. To do this, the West continued funding certain non-governmental organizations. It's very funny because a lot of these non-governmental organizations are governmental. They're financed by the United States government. The NGOs that had the most political and media influence in Serbia were the Humanitarian Law Center, officially led by Sandra Orlovic, who succeeded Natasha Kandic, the Center for Cultural Decontamination, led by Borka Pavicevic, the Helsinki Board for Human Rights, led by Sonja Biserko, the Youth Initiative for Human Rights, led by Maja Micic, and the Center for Euro-Atlantic Studies, led by Jelena Milic. Most of these NGOs operated in other republics of the former Yugoslavia as well, but the Serbian representatives were the most interesting. Serbian public, they immediately discard us and discharge us as a paid by NATO. But where does the center receive its funding? From Open Society Fund uh, in Belgrade, from uh, National Endowment for Democracy, from uh, Rockefeller Brother Foundation. National Endowment for Democracy, Rockefeller Brothers. Uh... Uh, uh, from, uh, for two events, uh, from NATO public diplomacy, but uh, it was not enough. So you are paid by NATO in a way? For two events. From the beginning when we were <coughs> formed, it was uh, support from Swedish Helsinki Committee and uh, it's called, uh, now it's Fund for Open Society and it is the Soros Foundation. And some governments like Norway, which is very present in the region, not only helping NGOs but also state. The Norwegian people aid uh, built us a roof because it was ruined. Here where we are, look at this, it looks like that. And then through different humanitarian programs and so on. Who financed the center? What Ms. Kandic didn't want to say is that her humanitarian law center was directly funded by the National Endowment for Democracy, the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, the Open Society Foundation, USAID, the United States Institute of Peace, the Balkan Trust for Democracy, Civil Rights Defenders, the King Balding Foundation, and then there's also the European Commission, the OSCE Mission to Serbia, the British Embassy in Belgrade, the Austrian Development Cooperation, the Canadian Embassy in Belgrade, the German Embassy in Belgrade, the Royal Netherlands Embassy in Belgrade, the Swiss Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and 10 other foreign organizations. At the end of the day, whose interest is Ms. Kandic looking after? The citizens of Serbia, who largely dislike her work, or all these foreign governments and organizations which give her money? But the foreign financiers don't stop with the NGOs that I mentioned. Some also fund UCOM Lawyers Committee for Human Rights, Women in Black, Peshtanik or Hourglass, Sanja Committee for the Protection of Human Rights and Freedoms, Civic Initiatives, and many others. Don't let the whole human rights mantra fool you. Ima li svako pravo na različito mišljenje? Nema. Pre svega, mi svako, svako ko šta govori i radi nije nužno mišljenje. Kako je moguće u demokratiji da nema prava na različito mišljenje? E, pa u tome i jeste problem. This is especially interesting considering that Borka Pavicevic's Center for Cultural Decontamination received $38,000 in 2013 from the National Endowment for Democracy to promote public debate on various issues. Does everybody have the right to a different opinion? 
it be, it, uh, uh, it is uh, uh, it's, uh, some NGO members were also members of political parties at the same time, like Dushan Gamser, who was an economic advisor at the Center for Euro Atlantic Studies, as well as the international secretary of the Liberal Democratic Party. So you're a member of a political party and you work at an NGO? Yes, yes, why not? You don't think there's a conflict of interest? No, I don't. Why not? Yeah, uh, these are uh, different uh, uh, things. Uh, in political party, you, you, you are helping uh, your party colleagues to get to power, you are advising them, you, you do things, various things in the party. And when you are in the NGO, you do uh, uh, things, uh, maybe same things, by other methods. So where is the line between these NGOs and political parties? Aren't NGOs supposed to be the corrective factor of all levels of government, instead of betting on who'll get into the government? The goal of these NGOs, however, was something else. We all gathered ourselves pretty much on the same values and same goals that we thought would be good for Serbia for more than 10 years in different settings of, our, of us knowing each other more or less. And whenever we recruit new interims or whoever, we always uh, refer them to our website, to our manifesto, and openly say that we are in favor of Serbian NATO membership. But it doesn't stop there. These NGOs don't wait for citizens to become legal adults in order for those NGOs to start recruiting them or shaping their opinions on various political or social issues. We have, for example, many educational programs uh, now 10 years, uh, mostly secondary school children and students. So we have human rights schools which last 10 days. We gather children from all over Serbia, from different backgrounds. We select usually 30 children. In 10 days, and it's a very intensive program, they really change. In what way? They're offered a framework, a referential framework to think. You just have to guide them, to tell them what is wrong and what is good, what is evil, you know. So these elementary things, uh, just to show them direction. They easily accept it. Yes, children do tend to get brainwashed more easily. That's why NGOs don't waste time in making it clear who are the world's good guys. The West is almost a synonym for, for democracy, for the respect of human rights and rule of law, for individual uh, liberties. But hey, I'm sure these NGOs can be critical towards the West as well, despite receiving money from them. Do I think that the uh, uh, United States might be unfair sometimes uh, towards uh, someone, somebody? Yes, yes, of course. No one is Are there any examples of that? Sure. I don't know. Well, now, now I have hard times uh, imagining uh, the example, but uh, maybe... That's okay. It's not like the United States or the CIA ever admit to making mistakes either. The United States uh, and the CIA is one of its uh, uh, implements, uh, uh, made mistakes and makes mistakes all the time. Oh, so the former CIA director does admit that. But Dusan Gamser can't think of any mistakes. I don't know. Talk about being more Catholic than the Pope. Because they are technically non-governmental, Whatever they do, the country that they're acting in, uh, can't, you can't accuse the United States of doing it because it's an, a non-governmental organization that is doing this subversion. Some other countries knew how to deal with this. 
In 2012, Russian President Vladimir Putin approved a law which was previously cleared with overwhelming support by parliament, obliging NGOs that receive funding from abroad to register as foreign agents. The US State Department quickly condemned the law, which was really odd considering that the US passed a very similar law, the Foreign Agents Registration Act, back in 1938. Today's threat to our national security is not a matter of military weapons alone. We know of new methods of attack. The Trojan horse, the fifth column, spies, saboteurs, and traitors. Our moral and our mental defenses must be raised up as never before against those who would cast a smoke screen across our vision. The U.S. law requires groups representing the interests of foreign powers in a political or quasi-political capacity to disclose their relationship with the foreign government and information about related activities and finances. This law is still in effect in the U.S. If America really is about freedom, democracy and the rule of law, then it should be doing the same sort of thing in Saudi Arabia, but they don't. Believe it or not, it's the only country in the world that forbids women from driving a vehicle. Last month, yet another woman was executed on charges of sorcery and witchcraft. Beheaded for sorcery. The 54-year-old was beheaded by a single blow of sword earlier this month. Saudi officials then dangled her corpse from a helicopter to make sure the public could see the grotesque result of the execution. A country where homosexuality is punishable by death. A country where apostasy is punishable by death. A country where adultery for women is punishable by death. Oh, well, no, no, men are allowed to have as many wives as they want. Let's have a look at the situation for women. Uh, they barely have any rights. Their rights in education is restricted. They're restricted when it comes to elections. So that just shows what Saudi Arabia is like domestically. But you could argue there's even a more sinister aspect to Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia has been and remains the leading exporter of Islamic extremism to the world and Islamic terrorism in the world. It was Saudi Arabia that gave birth to Al-Qaeda, from 9-11 to Bali to Madrid to London to Damascus. The roots go all the way back to Saudi Arabia. Wow, from what this guy's saying, Saudi Arabia sounds like a horrible place. It must be on top of America's terrorist list. Well, they're not at all on top of America's terrorist list. Saudi Arabia is one of America's closest allies in the world because of the business links there. If the Americans were so sincere about protecting and encouraging human rights in the world and democracy. There'd be an American naval flotilla off the coast of Saudi Arabia. It's one of the most wicked regimes in the world. Can you imagine US-funded NGOs scheduling a date for a gay pride parade in the Saudi capital Riyadh? Or perhaps a punk band similar to the Russian Pussy Riot bursting into a mosque to denounce the Saudi monarchy? What do you think would happen to them? The foreign-funded civil society issue had little to do with human rights, and even less with democracy. In Introducing Democracy, a book written by David Beetham and Kevin Boyle, and published by UNESCO for the education of people in newly established democracies on human rights and political freedoms, it said that an influence of an NGO on a government can be democratic only if it stems from mass membership, and not that which stems from the accumulation of wealth or power in the hands of a few. In Serbia, according to their websites or statutes, the Center for Cultural Decontamination had 14 members, the Helsinki Board for Human Rights had 9 members, the Humanitarian Law Center had 8 members, and the Center for Euro-Atlantic Studies had 4 members. As for the funding, despite these organizations practically framing the word transparency on their walls, they never were very transparent regarding how much money they received. So I did a little investigative work and sent out questionnaires to all of the sponsors of the organizations that I mentioned, asking how much money they gave to the NGOs. A few actually replied.
And this was just the tip of the iceberg. So much for mass membership with no accumulation of wealth. For a group of organizations supportedly promoting democracy at every corner, they weren't very democratic at all. At least by UNESCO standards. Some of the individuals working in these NGOs advocated full acceptance of everything the International Monetary Fund demands, despite the lessons from Greece, Ecuador and many other countries. I don't think West uh, is enslaving us, I think West is liberating us. Uh, uh, International Monetary Fund is liberating us, accepting the terms of the International Monetary Fund are a step uh, forward for Serbia. The IMF serves the IMF, it doesn't serve any country. The IMF comes in like a vulture, it puts Serbia deeper into debt, that's what it'll do. So the people will be working for the international financial bankers. Though compliant in the beginning, the first post-Milosevic Prime Minister of Serbia, Zoran Djindjic, eventually started realizing what the IMF, together with Mlađan Dinkić and a few other so-called experts, were doing to his country. In the last months of his life, Zoran Djindjic even attempted to sack Mlađan Dinkić from the position of governor of the Serbian National Bank, and Djindjic set up a plan to start returning Serbia's loans in 2006. <laughs> This shocked many in international financial institutions and Western corridors of power. Sadly, Jinjic's plan was cut short. Zoran Jinjic was assassinated in March of 2003, and though a Serbian court convicted former paramilitary leader Milorad Ulemeklegija for the murder, the political background behind the assassination was never revealed. The next chosen Prime Minister, Vojislav Koštunica, continued Serbia's path towards integrations with the West, but he too at one point began to think that he could reduce Serbia's debt and get away with it. In 2007, yeah, at, at one point, Serbia was uh, uh, in the process of, of uh, lowering its uh, level of, of debt. By next year, Koštunica was gone. He wasn't assassinated, but his political career was, thanks to an unprecedented political and media campaign against him. Interestingly enough, many in Serbia who admire Zoran Djindjic today mostly do so because of his motivating speeches which were, frankly, very impressive. In them, Djindjic advocated a change of mentality, telling Serbs that they all had to work together in creating a better society. But they knew little about his bitterness regarding Western plans for Serbia in the last days of his life. In his very last interview, Djindjic talked about the West as he rarely did before. This interview was almost completely ignored in every documentary about the life and work of Zoran Djindjic. I došao je trenutak da sa tim kredibilitetom koji smo stekli i u koji niko ne može da sumnja, postavimo i neka teška pitanja. Jer ako naš međunarodni ugled treba da se zasnimo na tome da mi pričutkujemo svoj nacionalni interes, onda nam taj ugled baš i ne treba mnogo. Jer nema šanse danas da vi nekoga prisilite da radi nešto što je protiv njegovog interesa. To vreme je prošlo. Ne možete ni jedno dete više da prisiljavate da radi nešto što neće. A pogotovo neku zemlju. I drugo, nama u Beogradu dati pravo da i o svojim interesima govorimo na jedan i odlučan, otvoren, ali i efikasan način. Da ne budemo uvek na magarećoj kupi i kad se priča o nacionalnim interesima, onda Amerika može da ima nacionalni interes u Iraku. Ali Srbija ne može da ima nacionalni interes na posebu. Kako? He also hinted at where Srbija might look for economic cooperation as well. Mi nemamo jedan dobar tim da se bavi ekonomski odnosima sa Rusijom, sa Kinom, što je katastrofa. With both Djindjic and Koštunica out of the picture, Serbia's debt started sharply increasing. The people were confused. They were afraid. It seemed that everyone was against them and there was no way out. Then, a ray of light shined through. Another one. Ten more. Twelve shining stars. The European Union. The European Union is a international organization that is founded on the goal of trying to protect peace, considering that Europe as a continent was the most powerful ratovima. Tu su naravno na čelu najveću ulogu odigrale Njemačka, Britanija i Francuska i na taj način kroz nekakav stupanj ekonomske integracije pokušaju kroz ideju jedinstvenog tržišta i ekonomsko-monetarne unije pokrenuti tu zajedničku ideju očuvanja mira i mirne integracije. Europa je učinjena paralelu od Unijenog stavljena. Je učinjena više i više. 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 Je učinjena više. You do control your own currency. Uh, you can work your way out of excessive debt. Uh, 
case in point is Argentina. Ten years ago, roughly, it, uh, it was in a terrible economic crisis. It had followed all the rules of the, you know, the neoliberal rules, the IMF, the World Bank. It was kind of a poster child, in fact. And it crashed. And they, what they did was essentially default on their debts. Uh, it's called restructuring. So they restructured the debts. IMF couldn't force the country to pay it. Uh, all the economists predicted uh, it's going to be a hopeless disaster. Uh, for a couple of months, it was a serious problem, but then the country started growing again. Since then, it's had the maybe the highest growth rate in South America. Europe was a lovely place. Now, with this one eurozone, euro currency, I feel that it's like the United States. And I don't think these countries in Europe are like the states of the United States. They don't have a, an identity. A Croatian's a Croatian. Uh, a, uh, Serb is a Serb, an uh, Italian and a Frenchman, a German. All right, but I'd like to hear something from someone who actually lives in the EU. I live in France, and dissatisfaction with the EU is growing tremendously. Uh, even, I mean, I say even in France, because of course, situation is worse in Greece, uh, it's worse in Spain, it's worse in Portugal, uh, it's worse in Italy. Yeah, but isn't it important to you know, belong somewhere? Well, it's always the idea that there are good standards in the EU and it will be good for the fight against corruption, et cetera, to adopt European standards. Well, I would say if it's good to adopt those as standards, adopt the standards. I mean, if the standards are good, adopt them, European Union or not. Ugh, that sounds like a lot of work. Can't someone else do it? The fact is that belonging to the European Union has not been the great benefit to the existing members that it was promised. In Greece, before 1981, before the entrance of Greece to the European Economic Community, the predecessor structure to the European Union, they were saying literally, we will eat with golden spoons. It has not been the case because, in fact, the economic policy of all the countries is dictated by the bureaucracy. Look what happened to Greece 30 years in the European Union. And not only this phase now with the economic crisis. We have no productive basis, no agricultural sector. We are importing everything. And the tourism which we have are not leaving really wealth to the people. This is tour operators. This is money which goes again out of the country. Boy, this guy makes the EU sound like a Greek tragedy. Maybe the EU just doesn't like Greeks. What about the Croats? They recently joined the EU and love it. See? The Croatian president adores the EU. And that's because joining the EU made Croatia better. I'm sure the intellectuals agree. No, no, don't say that. Let's talk about how great the EU is. Oh, come on, you don't need factories and banks. Being in the EU is still better than being out. Now that's enough. I'm not going to hear another word against what Croatia has done to enter the EU or the EU itself. Wow, that's... no, no, maybe it'll be different for Serbia. No matter how much the Serbian government bows down to everything that the Europeans ask, they are still treated like uh, uh, they're doing something wrong. No, no, you, you can't really mean that. Serbia needs the EU. It's the ray of hope, the last chance. It seems to me rather sad that a country with the vigor, I think, intellectual and other uh, uh, that, of Serbia, for a small country, that it should pin all of its policy and hopes on getting into a club that apparently doesn't want it. All right, fine. At least Serbia got a lot of foreign investments, right? Fiat Leskovac, 
Golden Lady oznicu. Panasonic je sada u Srbiji i evo sada Johnson Electric je došao, ja sam taj ugovor bio suštinski potpisao, i Bosch i još dve stotine kompanija su izgradile fabrike širom Srbije, ali to nije dovoljno. And a small town in the south of the country was about to get a lesson in just how great foreign investments can be. Vranje had a well-developed shoe production company. Founded back in 1958, it started producing top-notch shoes which quickly made it the leader in women's and sports shoes in Serbia, Yugoslavia and the Balkans. The people were proud of their shoe company and it was called Koštana, named after the title of a book written by Boris Stanković, a famous Serbian writer born in Vranje. At its height, the company employed 4,000 workers and had production facilities in several municipalities around Vranje. Unlike Sever in my hometown Subotica, Koštana didn't survive the UN-imposed sanctions in the 1990s, it simply crashed. While some workers were old enough for retirement, many people who still could and wanted to make shoes couldn't find a job. Then a ray of hope appeared. In the 2000s, Serbian enterprising professionals in eight factories revived shoe production in and around Vranje. The Sanj company was the largest of them, employing 552 workers, while another 68 businesses were involved in manufacturing leather products and shoes, thus employing most of the skilled workers who were left without a job when Kostana collapsed. Some companies received help from SIEPA, the Serbian Investment and Export Promotion Agency. The companies produced shoes for such European fashion brands as Nero Giardini and Moschino of Italy, as well as Louis Vuitton of France. The locals in Vranje showed that they could do good business and employ a lot of people without foreign management or investment. Bez obzira što smo koristili usluge kooperanata, mi smo i pored toga znači širili svoju proizvodnju i ujedno sa kooperantima u gradu sarađivali i oni su se pored nas paralelno širili. Što je jako bitno da se kaže. But then Mlađan Dinkić had a brilliant idea. Mlađan Dinkić, minister financija i privrede i Mario Moretti Polegato, predsjednik kompanije Geox, potpisali su ugovor o dodeli sredstava za direktne investicije kojim će biti omogućeno otvaranje novih radnih mesta. In a situation where the biggest local shoe companies had formed a cluster called Koštana, slowly reviving the glory days of the old company, here was Dinkić bringing in a foreign company, the Italian Geox, to compete with local companies. Fair enough, one might say. Some healthy competition couldn't hurt. The problem was that unlike the local companies, which received around $2,800 per worker from SIEPA, Geox received over $12,400 per worker from SIEPA. This allowed Geox to snatch up many workers from the local companies which were doing good business, and with them, snatched up the profits as well, and took them to Italy. Pet puta više od nas koji dobije besplatno kompletno građevinsko zemljište, kompletne priključke za struju za vodu. I lično smatram da je prioritet bio neka vrsta slikanja medijske propagande, dolođenja investitora, a ne šta će sama ta investicija da donese u globalu. The local shoe companies were no match for Geox and their dream of reviving the pride that was once Koštana was fading away. The biggest foreign investment in Serbia is usually considered to be the acquisition of the Zastava car factory by Fiat. This is considered by many to be Dinkić's greatest success. However, despite the export of 117,000 vehicles worth around $2 billion, the local Fiat factory in the Serbian town of Kragujevac made just over $13 million in 2013. Since Serbia owns 33% of the factory, a little over $4 million belonged to Serbia. Considering the fact that Serbia invested $540 million into the factory, at this pace, it would take about 120 years to get back what was invested. The job is set so that everything is produced in Italy through Fiat's cooperators, while only the assembling is done in Serbia. If Serbia spends the money so that the profit goes to Italy, wouldn't it be more logical for Serbia to spend the money so that the profit stays in Serbia? What the example of Vranje showed was that locally grown industry could make it in the world market if properly stimulated. As the local companies were being foiled by their own government, unemployment started growing again. And for those who were too young to retire but too old to find a new kind of job, it seemed that there was only one solution for their problems. <laughs> Ne znaš kako dalje i od kaj da stvori za familija ili neko dinar za prehranu. 
This is Liliana Georgievska from UNIT, an organization that dealt with workers who lost their jobs because their companies went bankrupt following Macedonia's mismanaged privatization process. Macedonia, a former Yugoslav Republic, unlike their counterparts in Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia, Serbia and Montenegro, didn't experience wars or sanctions in the 1990s. The only armed conflict it experienced was in 2001, when Albanian separatists attempted a repeat of the Kosovo scenario. The Macedonians reacted, NATO stopped the Macedonian offensive, and a ceasefire was agreed upon, with Albanians getting many privileges but not allowed to secede. Dozens were killed in the conflicts, and it didn't affect the economy much. Oh, and the country had a very, very low suicide rate. And yet, more and more people were killing themselves in various ways. Македонија во текот на транзицијата се очекуваше пазарот на труд да се унапреди, да се отворат поголем број на работни места, всушност да поголем број на граѓани остварат, го остварат правото на вработување. Тоа не се случи, апсолутно најголем дел од граѓаните остана без вработување. Здравствена, здравствената реформа или приватизацијата на здравствената реформа исто така остави одреден број на граѓани надвор од системот на здравствена заштита, всушност оние кои што се најсиромашни и немаат здравствена заштита, така да состојбата генерално социјалната слика на Македонија е лоша. Ама немамо демократија. Немаме институција која работи за граѓани. Ако денеска не имаме релативна сиромаштија од 30,4%, имаме податоци за 2011 година. 2012 и 2013 година Македонија не објавува податоци за сиромаштијата, зошто и како ние може само да предпоставиме. Е, са истата таа релативна сиромаштија во 1998 година била 19%. Значи имаме рапиден раст на сиромаштијата во оваа држава. Сега моје плате не може суд да ми ги сплати, што су ми останали пред 10 година 12 у фирму. А за еден месец може да ми исклучи струја, ако нема, ма ја немам што да го платим. Во 2011 година 37,9 граѓани не можеле да се ги платат сметките за струја, вода и грејење, а 56,9%, скоро 60% од граѓаните ни се гладни во Македонија. Ми ако на затворе сутра да ме ухапсе ја ке сам пресречна верујте. Па за мене е тамо хотел А категорија. Ке имам бесплатно јадење, ке имам едно какво такво постелину, нема да имам извршители, нема да имам судови, нема да имам ништо мирно ке ми е глава тамо у четири зиде и баш ме брига. Многу пострашно е тоа што не постои социјален диалог заради партизираните и а, слабите синдикати и а, со самото тоа вие немате социјален диалог кој што ќе значи усогласување и на правата на работниците и на правата на работодавците. Не само што ние немаме синдикални движења, не само што немаме ние штрајкови, протести, тоа ние немаме ниту борба политичка некаква помеѓу а, владата, работниците, работодавците како трипартитен диалог кој што би донел до прогрес на правата на работниците. И тоа е утишано да кажеме. 56,4% од пензионерите примаат подпросечно примање, а 41% примаат најниска пензија, а таа е околу 130 евра. Тие вложувале 40 години во пензијскиот фонд преку своето работење, а денеска зима само 130 евра. И со тие 130 евра треба да се купи и лекови, кои што после 65 години тоа како му требаат, а треба да го одржува внукот, синот, снаата или керката, со зетот и така нада. Има фокус групи истражување кај што млад брачен пар со две, едно, две деца, вели, добро е кога имате пензионер во семейството, за да може да се прехраниме, а срекни сте кога има двајца пензионери, па тогаш дори луксузно живееме. Тоа укажува дека генерациите кои што сега се треба да имаат најголем придонес кон општеството тие не се ангажирани на пазар на труд и живеат од пензиите на своите родители. Yes, it was tough for Macedonia and many who used to be the golden middle class looked back to Yugoslavia with nostalgia. Точно га има онај осет и точно луѓи значи признаваат каде што велат во социјализам поубаво живеевме, има смо бесплатно школство, бесплатно здравство, иде смо кај што сакаме, има смо си е, К-15, има смо си одмори, може смо да се користимо. Меѓутоа, тој га сега, на жалост, немамо. И сега е, јавља се оној носталгија, и тој преголема носталгија, 
Зашто нарочито ми постаре генерација. Мами ни тати ни синови кои не се за уопште замучени за своја екзистенција, не умев да почитуе баш тој. Са разбијање на Југославија и са гашење економија, тоа би беше држај по републиками. Средна класа е потпуно обезправена, нема е, а постои каже велики јас измеѓу. Сиромашни и ултра богати. Јазот помеѓу богатите и сиромашните, заради политиките кои што се грижат за благосостојба на богатите, а не за благосостојбата на сиромашните и подобрување на состојбата, се зголемува. Во 98-ма индексот, Джини индексот, по кој што се пресметува јазот помеѓу богатите и сиромашните, бил 28,1. Во 2009-та пораснува до 43, што ни укажува со скоро дупла зголемување на јазот помеѓу богатите и сиромашните. Имате највисоката плата во Македонија е 185 пати поголема од просечната брута плата. This was the neoliberal paradise. Некад смо заправо истицали култ рада, култ знања, култ активности, а данас имамо култ богатство. Видимо дека богатство апсолутно критерији према кои се сви рамни. Дакле не морате да бидете нити образован, нити нешто посебно паметни, а лако имате пари, све се со своја врата отворена. If you had money, you could buy health. To a certain extent, of course. Most public hospitals were plunged into a severely dysfunctional state with a very small budget for equipment, supplies and staff, and with many doctors asking for or accepting bribes to perform even the simplest of medical procedures. For operations that couldn't be performed domestically, patients or their parents were forced to look for donations, while the rich treated themselves to private hospitals and trips to hospitals abroad. One Serbian health minister, Tomica Milosavljevic, from Mlađan Dinkić's party, actually went for an operation in Germany himself. Really sends the right message in terms of the people trusting their own healthcare system. Yes, it was a new age. We live in a kind of 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 до дана данас дае могуќност политичкото олигархи да креира закони кои користат само неки, што значи да политичка олигархија покојува само поединцима со кои има ту присвоена умоч дели. In Serbia, after the fall of Milosevic, the largest opposition party was the Serbian Radical Party. Its leader, Vojislav Šešelj, was locked up by the Hague Tribunal, accused of inducing war crimes through hate speech. This made his party an easy target for the parties that took power after Milosevic. All that the Democrats had to do was to remind everyone that if the Radicals took power, we'd all have a replay of the 1990s. And it was working, until the two main leaders under Vojislav Šešelj Tomislav Nikolic and Aleksandar Vucic abandoned the Radical Party. They formed the Serbian Progressive Party and switched their tune from a pro-Greater Serbia stance to a more Western-friendly stance. Suddenly it became obvious that their voters weren't so much interested in waging war against Serbia's neighbors as they were fed up with the way the post-Milosevic leaders ran the state. The Progressives won the 2012 elections, forming a ruling coalition with the Socialist Party of Serbia, the party Milosevic had founded. It was revenge for October 5th, 2000. But did anything essentially change? The new economic and finance minister was a familiar character, Lajan Dinkic. The difference was that the Western so-called foreign investments seemed to have been left in the shadow of a new foreign investor, the United Arab Emirates. <laughs> After early elections were called in March of 2014, the Serbian Progressive Party won an absolute majority in Parliament. Though Mlađan Dinkić was replaced before the election, this time he was definitely out. Was it finally a change of course? The earliest steps of this new government suggested more of the same economic policies that the Democrats imposed after the fall of Milosevic, but with a more aggressive stance. This time, the new Prime Minister Aleksandar Vucic openly called it shock therapy. He filled his government with neoliberal so-called experts, which was quickly praised by much of the media. I think it's good that some experts have come. I think, first of all, on the ministers of the economy, the economy, the finance and the administration. On the other hand, 
Udovički, na Dušana Vojevića. da, Lazar i ovaj, kako se zove? Dušan Vujović. Vujović, da. Oni pripadaju svi jednoj istoj školi, to je ta neoliberalna, koja ide na kresanje troškova opšte potrošnje, što nije samo država, nego i socijala. And the belief in democracy was not really shared by Serbians anymore. In the 2014 elections, Serbia witnessed the lowest voter turnout in its history. Did this mean that the people had lost faith in change through elections? Da li mislite da izborima mogu da se menjaju stvari u zemlji? Ja mislim da ne mogu. Do čega? Pa zato što dolaze uvek isti. Sami izbori za sebe čisto sumnju. Pa nikada to nije moglo, niti može dan danas. Ko će to znati? Ne mogu da se menju izborima. Ne mogu da se promene stvari. Pa mislim da ne mogu. Ne. Ne vrac. Ne vrujem. Ne. Ne. Ma jo. Izborima. Koga zezamo, živimo u Srbiji. U Srbiji ne. U Srbiji si išla kurta, došla murta. To je u stvari iluzija da mase misle da se nešto pitaju, da o nečem odlučuju. Da li se nešto realno promeni? Ne. Mislim da promene moraju da počnu od nas samih, a ne izvorima. Hvala. Nijedna vlast nije prošla na izborima a da je deklarirala, da je kazala da će vladat na duh i da će rasprodavati imovinu. Nekad tek kad je došla na vlast, onda je to činila. Što znači da se nijedan od ovih naroda u novonastrednih država nije mogao ni suprostaviti toj političkoj oligarhiji, jer nije znala te teške i grozne i ružne namjere prema svom narodu. Građani Srbije sve su manje zainteresovani za politički sistem u kome žive. Samo trećine misli da je demokratija idealan sistem, ostali su uvereni da je propast Srbije počela 5. oktobra. Protesti, danonoćne šetnje i borba za demokratijom nisu nam doneli ono što smo očekivali, ne živimo bolje. Polovina ispitanih građana smatra i da postoje i drugi sistemi koji bi mogli da odgovaraju Srbiji. Ubedljiva većina smatra da se najbolje živelo u doba socijalizma, odnosno u vreme TIT. 10% zlatno dobra ocenjuje kao period od 2000-te, malo manje njih smatra da se najbolje živelo 90-ih, a samo 4 od 100 ispitanih da se najbolje živi od 2012. godine. To meni, there seemed to be no light at the end of the tunnel. As a matter of fact, the light was closer than they thought. U.S. domination of world economic affairs was a reality after the end of the Cold War. But something different happened in 2010. The G20 held a summit in the South Korean capital of Seoul. U.S. presidents had little trouble enforcing their will on others regarding how the world economy should function in the past. But this time, Barack Obama got the cold shoulder. A new agreement was made, the Seoul Development Consensus, which had done away with many aspects of neoliberalism and allowed a larger role for state intervention. Instead of propagating a one-for-all solution imposed on everyone, it postulated that individual developing nations should shape their own economic reforms and policies. The Washington Consensus was officially dead. A multipolar world was rising again, with a group called BRICS, an association of the emerging national economies of Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, challenging the West. Well, all those countries are obviously countries that uh, at this moment seem to be having a very prosperous future and this changing economic circumstances and, you know, reaching out to them and trying to establish close cooperation with these countries is in every nation's interest, including Serbia. But what the mainstream media have done was to condition many people in Serbia to hop when they, for example, hear the word Russia and dismissively repeat how the Russians supported Serbia only because of Russia's own interests. I had many discussions in this regard uh, uh, when a lot of people were telling me, well, but Russia was uh, supporting you because of their own interest, you know? And I said, yes, maybe this is the case. People tend to support other people for the sake of their own interests. But unlike Russia, others were attacking us because of their interests, whilst Russia was supporting us because of their interests. And in that case, uh, I'd rather have someone supporting us for the sake of their own interests than attacking us. And I think it's logical. Logical indeed. However, the big Western corporations and neoliberal elites weren't ready to give up without a fight. Ne treba zaborati da svjetska oligarhija i krupni kapital 
ima ogromnu finansijsku moć i ogromna sredstva da u ovim zemljama, kao što je Srbija u većini zemalja, može da oblikuje i medijski i politički prostor onako kako njoj odgovara. Propaganda doesn't come marked saying I'm propaganda. Uh, you have to figure out what is. And in fact, anything that's coming from official sources is very likely to be designed to uh, influence or control minds. And anything that comes from elite circles uh, more or less reflects uh, official doctrine. Awareness comes through education. Change comes through action. But to change things for the better, you need that first step. Many would think that this is impossible, that the Western powers simply wouldn't allow it. But a revolution against neoliberalism happened recently in Europe. The mainstream media just didn't tell you much about it. Five years of a pure neoliberal regime in Iceland, a country of 320,000 inhabitants, made it the richest in the world. All of the three state banks were privatized in 2003 and borrowed over $120 billion over five years, ten times the size of Iceland's economy. They created a bubble and everything seemed to be marvelous. But in 2008, Iceland saw its bubble burst. The stock market plunged 90% while unemployment tripled in six months. The country's economy collapsed. Iceland needed to restore order, and they decided to find their own way to fix things. Many criticized them for deciding not to follow the neoliberal doctrine, but as Forbes magazine later wrote, Iceland's heavily criticized method to escape veritable economic demise actually did the trick. Forbes also wrote, instead of bailing out banks USA style, the country forgave mortgage debt for the population and completely started over from square one. See, instead of allowing the neoliberal elites and bankers that destroyed the country's economy to get away with it, Iceland actually thought that it might be a cool idea to indict bankers who committed serious financial crimes which made the collapse possible. The government nationalized the banks, paid off loans for consumers, forgave homeowner debt, and threw the offenders in prison. Simply said, Iceland said no to neoliberalism. We didn't follow the uh, traditional uh, prevailing orthodoxies of the Western world in the last 30 years. We introduced currency controls, we let the banks fail, we uh, provided support for the poor, we didn't introduce austerity measures of the scale you're seeing here in Europe. And Iceland bounced back, with its economy quickly growing faster than both the US and European economies. Change isn't impossible. In fact, it's absolutely necessary, not only in the former Yugoslavia, but in countries worldwide. The 2008 financial crisis showed that neoliberalism was a surefire way to instability, vast inequality, and disaster. But for change to be effective, it has to have a course. And I believe that course can be summed up in three crucial measures. Protect your local economy. This means getting rid of neoliberalism. Capitalism should work for the national economy, and this means protecting local industry from subsidized imports, even if it means being criticized by the EU, IMF, the US, and other rich countries. What also needs to be done is to limit foreign investments, while investing in the domestic industry and supporting it, as this is what every country which is rich today did when it was growing and becoming rich. For example, in the 19th century, the United States strictly regulated foreign investment in banking, shipping, mining, and logging, while Japan and Korea severely restricted foreign investment in manufacturing. In Finland, between the 1930s and 1980s, companies with more than 20% foreign ownership were officially classified as dangerous companies. Today, Singapore is also used as an example of a successful economy, but despite its free market image, it has one of the largest public enterprise sectors in the world, producing around 30% of the national income. Public enterprises were also crucial in France, Austria, Norway, and Taiwan. In most Balkan countries, there are many public companies that are losing money and serve as job providers for political party members. But instead of privatizing them, the government should invest in making them profitable for the betterment of society, engaging professional managers to run them for the benefit of the community. Even if it takes time to do so, investing in yourself will always prove beneficial. Create a functioning welfare state. Neoliberalism would want you to think that if someone isn't successful, it's not because the system doesn't work, but it's because that person isn't dedicated and hardworking enough. Though working hard is important, even billionaire Warren Buffett, the most successful investor of the 20th century, admitted that society was responsible for a very significant percentage of what he earned. If you stick me down in the middle of Bangladesh or Peru or, or someplace, you, you'll find out how much, you know, it's talent is going to produce in the wrong kind of soil and you know I will be struggling 
30 years later. Nobel Prize winning economist and social scientist Herbert Simon estimated that social capital is responsible for at least 90% of what people earn in wealthy societies like those of the United States or Northwestern Europe. And by social capital, Simon meant not only natural resources, but more important, the technology and organizational skills in the community and the presence of good government. This also means providing for those who are less fortunate than others, and in doing so, creating a society where welfare, education and healthcare will provide a more productive environment and higher living standard. Se smeta deka овие граѓани кои што живеат на социјална помош се мрзливи и дека живеат на грбот на државата. Јас неколку пати сум го поставил ова како прашање пред владените институции, а, дали смета дека Стварно примателите на социјална помош живеат од нивната социјална помош. Јас тврдам дека не е тоа така. Тие се на пазар на сива економија, продаваат и собираат железо, старо железо, продаваат собираат стара пластика, а, или се некаде по пазарите и продаваат одредени работи кои што ги произвеле самите. Иако вие како некој кој што е на функција се обидете да ја работите оваа работа за да дневно донесете 200 денари, Кажете ми дали сте мрзлив и дали се мрзливи тие луѓе кои што се којдневно се борат за корка парче леп. If the system is established to keep hard working people impoverished, it simply has to be changed in the interest of the people. As renowned economist Ha Jun Chang said, a well-designed welfare state can actually encourage people to take chances with their jobs and be more, not less, open to changes. Make protesting a way of life. When you ask an average Serbian what protesting against Milosevic in the 1990s did, odds are he or she will say nothing. In fact, as we all know, the protests eventually did topple Milosevic. So, protesting does work. Whether it's through going out on the street, civil disobedience, or public awareness campaigns, if organized well and done with enough conviction. However, if you want a society that continues going forward, changing something once won't do the trick. I'm sorry to say so. Life is a constant struggle, and the prosperous countries are those which have citizens who always try to improve the system. A new generation was rising, one that wasn't tired of protesting in the 1990s, one that was internet savvy and could see their countries and the world through many different perspectives. While the internet was still free, they could express themselves and connect with others. Even though social networks pacified many, some used their advantages to gather momentum. The youth was realizing that governments make decisions in favor of the people only when in fear of the public reaction. A new wave had to form, a loud, strong and unstoppable wave of change. And to be a part of it, there were only three simple things you had to do. Revolt, network, resist. resist. Let's breathe and fight for the best.